Hello everyone and welcome to CramSurg, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinions and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Right, so we'll talk about measures of risk, the final uh, part. Uh, so for those of you who have not come across the earlier versions, um, they're all there on the website and on YouTube. It might be worth your while um, looking through parts one to three and because um, we're going to skip over the basic concepts and go on straight to um, time to event data. Right, um, a couple of slides on what we learned before in parts one to three. We talked about um, odds ratios, relative risks and attributable risks as uh, commonly used measures of risk. We talked then about relative risk reductions, absolute risk reduction, and number needed to treat. Um, and uh, we then moved on to time to event data. So when we talk about time to event data, we mean uh, not just the event happening. Uh, so we're interested in not only whether a specific event that we're interested in happens or doesn't happen, like for example, death, or a wound infection or a recurrence of a hernia, for example. But we're also interested in when that event happens. You know, does it happen uh, early on um, during the course of uh, follow up or does it take many, many years? Because obviously uh, that's important. That's quite important as well, as you can imagine. We in the last part talked about what hazard ratio means. Hazard ratio is a risk measure used for time to event data. It's very, very similar uh, conceptually to relative risk, and it compares time to event data in two groups. So we're now going to move on to talking a little bit more about time to event data. So let's just take survival as an example, um, which, which is essentially um, whether somebody has survived a particular sort of disease um, uh, or not. So how can we describe survival? We can either describe survival as a percentage of patients surviving at a specific time uh, period. So you could say uh, following treatment of, let's say, colorectal cancer, 90% um, survived at one year. Um, you could say 74% survived at three years, or you could say even smaller percentage survived at five or 10 years. And that's a useful um, way of uh, depicting to clinicians and to patients, you know, what the survival chances are. You could also look at survival slightly differently and you could say, you know, 50% of the patients in your cohort lived um, for up to six years. So there you're talking about median survival. And again, you could say what the lower quartile was or the upper quartile was, or you could say 90% of, of patients survived X number of years. So there are these different ways of talking about um, survival. Uh, so you, you're talking about survival at a specific time period, or you're talking about uh, the number of years a particular proportion of your cohort survived. To describe or present all of the above, we use a survival curve. So we'll talk about survival curves in the next two slides. Right. So here is a typical survival curve. This is a kaplan meyer survival curve. Uh, I've got this data from uh, my PhD from many, many years ago. Uh, you've got the survival of patients with grade three breast cancer plotted on this graph. So on the x-axis, you have time to um, a specific endpoint. Here, this is death or metastasis in months. And on the y-axis, you have the probability of people surviving. So right at the top here, and I'll try and show you here, right right at the top, at the beginning of the study, if you like, uh, you have uh, all of your patients being alive. And then as time goes on, you have patients 
um, uh, dying or developing metastasis over time. And the y-axis gives you the probability uh, of surviving at a particular time point. OK, so there are lots of YouTube tutorials on um, how to create a survival curve and also explanations on uh, how you interpret survival curves in a lot more detail than we have time for. So I'll try and um, give you a, a bird's eye view of uh, what we ought to sort of um, uh, learn about survival curves. So um, these curves show proportion surviving um, without the event happening over time, just like I explained. Uh, and and you've got to keep in mind that the event does not have to be death. So a survival curve could be anything. It could be occurrence of a hernia, for example, or reoccurrence of a hernia after repair, for example. Uh, but they're all called survival curves. All of these time to event data uh, are uh, typically called survival curves. And sometimes the event can be a composite event, like either death or metastasis. So uh, any event that you're particularly interested in, uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be death. Uh, survival curves usually take what we call censoring into account. So what's censoring? And uh, you, you probably have heard this word um, in the context of um, survival analysis. So censoring occurs when a patient drops out of the study for a number of reasons. The patient could have left a, the, 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 um, uh, your area and migrated to another country or another region and you don't have any data. So that date of migration or moving away from the area is taken as a date at which you censor the patient, which means that you accept that you do not have a, um, data beyond that point in time, and you know that at that point in time, they have not had the event. Another uh, example of uh, censoring could be if you're looking at um, a patient who's died of, say, a road traffic accident after being enrolled in your study for um, a specific treatment for grade three breast cancer, and you have said that the, uh, you're only interested in events that are directly related to breast cancer, or in other words, deaths from breast cancer, um, and they've, if they've died of a road traffic accident, then you, at that point in time, say that they are censored. So that would be another good example of censoring. A third example of censoring would be that if, if you have done a study over a 10 year period and you have recruited a patient in year nine, and then you've got just one year of follow up and you've completed your study and that at one year, the patient obviously um, is still alive um, and you do not have data beyond the year because you're stopping the study then again, at one year, that patient would be considered to have been censored. So a number of reasons why censoring um, can occur. Now, survival data is usually presented using non-parametric methods. And the reason for this is that uh, you do not need to make any assumptions about the distribution of the survival times. So yeah, and you may know that for some diseases, um, the survival um, in the first few years after the occurrence of the disease uh, might be low in that many patients might die very early. And then once they've survived beyond a certain point, um, then their um, the chances of continuing to survive goes up. And in other diseases, it might be the other way around. So if you employ non-parametric methods, then you don't have to make any assumptions about how the survival um, uh, is distributed or how the events are distributed over time. So that's a kind of typical sort of conventional thing to do, describe survival using non-parametric methods. And there are a couple of important assumptions uh, that you've got to keep in mind when you're looking at the survival curve. The first is that the censoring is independent of the event. So uh, patients migrating or dying of other causes, um, those events should be independent of the event of interest, i.e. dying of breast cancer or getting metastasis from breast cancer. The other important assumption is that the probability of survival is independent of the start times. And this is very important and often um, not clearly understood. So what I mean by this is that if you're including patients in um, your breast cancer study, for example, um, for over 10 years, then you've got to 
um, make the assumption that patients getting enrolled into your study in the first two, three years, they, uh, their prognosis, their survival uh, is the same as patients getting into your study in the last few years of the study. Because if treatments have changed dramatically during your study, and the prognosis changes dramatically because of changes in treatment, then you really shouldn't be looking at the survival of uh, this entire um, cohort accrued over 10 years. I hope that makes sense. If not, come back to me uh, during questions and I'll explain this again. Right, so that's the Kaplan-Meier survival curve again in a cohort of um, grade three breast cancer patients. So that's the same curve that we've seen. You've got to keep in mind that there is another type of survival curve called the actuarial survival curve. Now, in Kaplan-Meier survival curves, each time an event happens, you um, plot or you calculate the cumulative survival. So let's say you've got a couple of deaths occurring in a very short interval of time. At that point, you uh, calculate the, your cumulative survival. And then you carry on, and then when the death occurs again, you calculate your cumulative survival again. So each time an event happens, you work out the probabilities and you plot them on the graph. Well, you don't do them physically. You have lots of different software that can do this for you. Contrast this to an actuarial survival curve. Here what happens, you've got this uh, so actuarial survival curve on the same cohort of patients plotted on the graph on the top right of your screen. Here, the cumulative survival or the probability of you surviving is plotted or is calculated at specific time intervals. In this particular graph, we've done this every year. So every year, you calculate what the cumulative survival is, and then you go on for another year and then calculate what the cumulative survival uh, is. So the main difference between what we call actuarial survival curves and the Kaplan-Meier survival curves is this. In the actuarial survival curve, you plot the probability at fixed and regular time intervals. In the Kaplan-Meier survival curve, you plot the survival each time an event happens. Now, the good news is that in most of medical literature, we use Kaplan-Meier survival curves. But I thought it was important for you to just keep in mind that you can plot survival curves in two different ways. Okay. Now let's just move on to something that I think um, is probably a little bit more interesting. So not all survivals are the same. What do I mean by this? Now when you're plotting a survival curve and you're talking of survival, median survival and what have you, you've got to be careful about what you mean by the event of interest and you've got to define it very clearly. So when you say survival uh, and death, uh, you have to understand what you mean by survival or death. You might find that strange, but what I'm trying to say is you've got to talk about um, if death is your event, you've got to look into what is um, the cause of death, whether you're interested in death from any cause or whether you're interested in death from um, the specific disease you're interested in. You then have to decide a priori when to censor and decide on what events to ignore. Now, if you take the example of, say, um, colorectal cancer, um, and I've shown you, I've shown you this uh, little table here, it might appear a little bit complicated, but I'll explain this table. You can see that survival can be defined in a number of different ways. And this table has been derived from, uh, has been extracted from a systematic review that looked at how survival was defined in a number of colorectal cancer trials. And you can see here that um, they have on this, in this table, at least six uh, different ways in which survival has been defined. So let's just look at a couple of them and then hopefully it'll make sense. So OS, OS stands for overall survival. And here um, the end point is death from any cause. So if there's death from the same cancer or from another cancer or there's a non-cancer related death or a treatment related death, you consider that as an event. So it doesn't matter uh, what they died of, if they've died, that's an event. If they just had disease recurrences or they had a second cancer, then they're all to be ignored. Those events are to be ignored completely. Uh, obviously, if there's loss to follow up, then you censor them. 
So, so if you um, uh, are interested in overall survival as your endpoint, then this is how you define your events of interest. You decide when to censor and you decide what to ignore. Another example is, um, at the other end of the scale is what we call disease free survival. DFS. You probably come across this in a number of uh, um, on a number of occasions. Here, disease-free survival um, means that you're interested in either death from any cause or recurrence of the disease or recurrence of um, uh, you know the colorectal problem. So, if you had recurrence or distant metastasis or a second colorectal primary, or if you've died from colorectal cancer or any other death you are interested in it and you classify that as an event of interest. Um, if you lost a follow up, then you're censored and you're not really ignoring um, any uh, death from any cause um, or, or um, whatever recurrence um, uh, related to the cancer um, happens, you know, you're not going to ignore anything. So, so you can see how disease free survival and overall survival differ. And then if you're interested, if you have time, you can come back and look at uh, what recurrence free survival is, time to recurrence, time to treatment failure, and cancer specific, uh, cancer -specific survival are. Now, um, I, I'm generally interested in cancer specific survival as an end, end point, and also sometimes in disease free survival. And they are actually quite different. A lot of people um, assume that disease free survival and disease specific survival are very similar. But actually, they're not. So if you have time, you come back and look at this chart and you will find that um, the events of interest, the censoring and the events um, that are ignored are quite different between disease free survival and disease specific survival. OK, so why does this matter? Now, let's just take uh, these um, two extreme examples, overall survival and then disease free or disease specific survival. Now, clearly overall survival is going to be influenced not just by the treatment of the cancer, but also by other factors such as toxicity and chemotherapy toxicity, for example, associated morbidity and age. Whereas disease free survival or disease specific survival is going to give you a more accurate reflection of the efficacy or effectiveness of the treatment. So that's an important difference. If you look at objectivity, Overall survival, which is essentially saying death from any cause will be an event, is pretty objective, so you can't argue about death or um, being dead or alive. However, if you look at disease-free survival or disease-specific survival, it is not very objective at all. And this is um, one um, area in cancer epidemiology that people tend to get uh, a little bit perplexed. If you say to them that the disease-free survival is not a very objective measure, uh, you might find some eyebrows being raised. But essentially, what you're saying is, depending on how frequently you're going to screen for disease occurrence, let's say colorectal cancer, you've, you've um, given a specific chemotherapeutic regimen in your cohort of patients, and then you want to follow them up. And if you decide to screen them every three months, as opposed to every two years, survival, then you might get the numbers you need and the uh, events happen a little bit sooner and you could finish the study relatively early. Right, so we come to the learning points. So we talked about time to event data, and we talked about how time to event data is usually best presented as survival curves, as opposed to just saying median survival or X percentage at five years or so, and so. And Kaplan-Meier curves and actuarial curves are the two ways in which you can present a survival curve, Kaplan-Meier curves are the ones that are commonly used in medical literature. And uh, just remember that in a Kaplan-Meier curve, at every um, point or time um, period an event occurs, you calculate your probability of survival. Um, it's important to think, to think about the endpoint in some detail, you know, how do you define your event, what can be considered non-events and um, when would you say censoring occurs. So when you're critiquing a paper with survival data or if you're doing a study, by, um, uh, if you're conducting a study, it's important to think about these endpoints. And 
there are a number of different endpoints. I showed you a, a sample from colorectal cancer literature. There are about six or seven different endpoints. They all have slightly different utilities and um, or of value in, in different contexts. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast. <laughs>